Good morning and welcome to the official launch of IWA's Best Practice Access Guidelines, the fourth edition. My name is Tony Cunningham and I'm the National Director of IWA Services with responsibility for access. I'm delighted to be the MC um, for the launch today of the guidelines. Um, it's a great day for the association and it's a, a unique event with our first virtual launch. So here's hoping that that all goes well. It's also a very special day for the organisation as today we celebrate the 60th anniversary of the foundation of Irish Wheelchair Association. So this day, the 10th of November in 1960, in the pillar room um, of the Matter Hospital in Dublin, the, the association was founded. We have an excellent and interesting panel of speakers today that include Michael Hennessy Cullen and his wife Leona Tuck. We have Fanula Rogerson, an architect, and we have Professor Gerard Quinn um, to speak to us as well. Seeing that it's the 60th anniversary of uh, the foundation of the association, we also will have uh, an address by our sole uh, remaining founding member of the association, Dr. Oliver Murphy, in conversation with our very own John Fulham. So that's something that we look forward to um, later in the morning. Thank you for joining us I, uh, virtually. Um, I encourage you to sit back and relax. You would have received some guidance notes that would assist you. Um, so just uh, for housekeeping matters at the moment, um, if you wish uh, to have the subtitles, um, you may go to the settings on the bottom right hand side of your screen and you can activate the captions or, or subtitles uh, there uh, and consult again the guidance note if you're having difficulty with that. As we progress through the launch, um, there will be an opportunity at the end for um, questions to be answered. So I encourage you all, if you look to the top right hand side of your screen, you see a Q&A icon. And you can access that throughout the session uh, after the various speakers to submit um, your question and we'll endeavour to answer as many of those as possible uh, at the end of the session. So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to the CEO of the Irish Wheelchair Association, Rosemary Kyo. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Tony, for those wonderful words of introduction. I just want to reiterate some of what Tony has said in welcoming all of you to our virtual event today. We have over 300 people registered for this event, and the delegates today are drawn from our own Irish Wheelchair Association membership, from county councils, Oireachtas members, the HSC, and industry professionals in engineering, construction, and architects, as well as access groups and advocates from all around the country. Tony has welcomed and thanked all of our speakers, and I want to take the opportunity now to thank the IWA team who have developed and written this version of our best practice access guidelines. Special tribute to Dolores Murphy, Bridget Boyle and Nicola MacDonald, who put many, many months of tireless work into developing what we're launching successfully, hopefully today. And I also want to thank our in-house design team of Garrett Green and Donnie Keane, who put together what is a, a very large, but really, really fabulous, dynamic and interactive document. And I really urge you all, when you get the opportunity to spend some time reading it and going through it, because it, it really is a wonderful piece of work and one that we're very, very proud of. Tony has talked about what a special day today is in the history of Irish Wheelchair Association. And as he has said, this day 60 years ago, our last surviving founder member, Dr. Oliver Murphy, and a small group of wheelchair users made the decision to launch the Irish Wheelchair Association. Many of them having returned from the first Paralympics in Rome in 1960 and having realised in talking to some of the other athletes from other countries how much work needed to be in, done in Ireland to improve accessibility for people with disabilities. This year has been an extraordinary year in the history of Irish Wheelchair Association. In one weekend back in March, we had to adapt how we do everything, how we work, how we deliver our services, how we continue to provide the supports that our members and service users across the country need. And we've done that successfully but it hasn't been easy. 
I remember talking to Oliver very early on in the, the first lockdown, the first COVID-19 COVID restrictions back in March. And we were talking about the challenges that we face. And, you know, Oliver said something to me that day that, that has stayed with me through the very difficult few months that we've experienced. And he said to me, you know, Rosemary, Irish Wheelchair Association just keeps going. That's what we do. And I think today with the launch of those these guidelines, we're really seeing this in what has been a tumultuous and very difficult year. We're continuing to be resilient. We're continuing to innovate. We're continuing to look to the future and make Ireland a country to be proud of for people with disability and all of our citizens that we can achieve a fully inclusive and equal society. As well as launching the guidelines today, this week we're also launching our new website and on Thursday we're going to start working on our next strategic plan. Always looking to the future, always being ambitious and always trying to deliver on that vision of a better Ireland for people with disabilities. As Tony has mentioned, we'll be hearing directly from Oliver in conversation with John Fulham later on and, and I for one am very much looking forward to do that. Irish Wheelchair Association's access guidelines set the standard for accessibility in Ireland across construction, housing, public amenities, retail, tourism and sport. This latest edition has been inspired by the experiences of IWA members who 60 years on continue to experience poor accessibility within their local communities and that pose problems for them on a daily basis and limitations on how they live their lives. We surveyed almost a thousand people for this edition of the Best Practice Access Guidelines. And there's one quote in the guidelines that really sums up the experience of our members, where they say, it isn't the wheelchair that makes me disabled. It's the buildings and the places. Today, 77% of people with physical disabilities have poor or no access to public spaces. And two thirds of those surveys report difficulty in accessing public buildings. And this is all before the additional restrictions of COVID-19. So our call to action to all of you attending and joining us today is to download a PDF of our new best practice access guidelines, which are now available on our new website, request a hard copy of the document, advocate and lobby with your public representatives, your county councils, people in industry to ensure that we move closer and faster towards a built environment that will create an equal Irish society for people with disabilities. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the rest of our speakers this morning. Thank you, Rosemary, um, for those inspiring words. What strikes me is that within the association, we always say people are at the heart of everything that we do as an organisation and true to form, you started with the members of the association, which is the reason why we exist as an organisation. What I would say to everybody on this launch and the virtual launch today is to consider and maybe to ask yourself, am I an influencer um, in the built environment for change and can I be an influencer going forward? Um, and we'll leave you with that question. To give us a, a brief overview of the guidelines edition four um, it's my pleasure now to welcome you um, or to introduce you to Emma Jane Morrissey. Uh, Emma Jane joined the association in August as the National Access Program Manager and the guidelines are if you like uh, the tool um, which Emma Jane will be using in her work um, over the, the coming years um, and something that she's very much looking forward to. So without further ado, um, Emma Jane Morrissey.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today to the launch of Irish Wheelchair Association's Best Practice Access Guidelines, fourth edition. It is my privilege to have recently joined the Irish Wheelchair Association as the National Access Programme Manager and to continue the tremendous work of my predecessor, Dolores Murphy. I am particularly privileged to have the task of promoting access and specifically these access guidelines. Through these guidelines, it is the goal of the Irish Wheelchair Association to ensure that all new legislation and public policy recognises the importance of good access, ensuring planning decisions reflect the highest standards of accessibility as outlined in the guidelines and support organisations and individuals in developing best practice building plans with accessibility to the fore. Access to the built environment has always been a persistent issue for IWA members. In 2007, in response to our members' requests, the Irish Wheelchair Association set up an access working group consisting of both people with and without mobility issues, with the chief aim of addressing access issues and sourcing solutions. This resulted in the first issue of the Irish Wheelchair Association Best Practice Access Guidelines, which were published in May 2009. Following a review of the first book, the second edition was published in 2010, which also reflected the opinions of our members. In 2013, the Access Working Group took on the task of producing an updated version of the guidelines, taking on board new legislation and again the opinions of our members. This edition was with written with involvement from staff and members across the organ and here you can see a picture of the cover of the third edition which was launched on the 4th of July 2014. And so today we are proud to be launching this fourth edition. Like the previous editions, these fourth edition of the guidelines are informed and directly respond to the experience of IWA members who continue to experience poor accessibility within local communities that impose limitations on their daily lives. These limitations were summed up by our members in a number of interviews conducted in the development of the guidelines. On the screen here, there are, there are visible some of the excerpts from these interviews, uh, more of which you can examine by reading the guidelines. In reading the excerpts from the interviews, it is clear, access greatly impacts upon people's lives. Good access has the power to open up so many opportunities, but poor access inhibits autonomy and inhibits independence. In preparing this, the fourth edition of the guidelines, the Irish Wheelchair Association surveyed 1,000 of our members. The questions posed were designed to seek opinions on levels of accessibility in specific locations, such as the outdoor environment, buildings to which the public has access and facilities and services within buildings. On the screen here, you can see an example of the consultation process, which not only included interviews and surveys, but also focus groups and workshops. Results from the survey that we did showed that the top three new areas that we were asked to consider this year were the design and provision of changing places bathrooms, wheelchair accessible housing design, and the design of healthcare facilities. These experiences are reflected in the fourth edition, which has also been updated to include guidance in shared spaces and cycle lanes, office accommodation, student accommodation, hair, hair salons and beauty salons, and places of worship. And on the slide here, there are examples and pictures of each of these new places. The Irish Wheelchair Association recognises that many of our recommendations go beyond the minimum requirements outlined in Irish building regulations and also exceed many international standards. We can confidently and legitimately advocate for this because our guidelines reflect the first-hand experience of our members and aspire to create a built environment that accommodates all people. The aim of the guidelines is that they will be used to inform plans in the development of new facilities and consulted with when updating existing facilities. By following these guidelines, developers, local authorities and individuals will be building to the highest possible standard, 
thereby supporting complete independent access to the built environment for all people. The question of access for people with limited mobility and wheelchair users has always been the single biggest issue to impact on individual lives. Without good accessibility, the ability of a person to live independently and to be treated as equal is severely impacted upon. Indeed, access is more than a question of getting into a building or navigating a streetscape. It is about what it opens up for a person and the chances and opportunities that it provides. The ability to access a building inevitably results in access to education, access to employment, access to independent housing, and indeed boundless possibilities for a person to live the life they choose. From today, you can download the online version of the Irish Wheelchair Association for fourth edition best practice access guidelines at www.iwa.ie. You will note these guidelines sit alongside a partner piece on accessibility, which is the Great Outdoors. This promotes accessibility to natural outdoor amenities. And here on the screen, you can see side by side pictures of the covers of the Great Outdoors and the fourth edition best practice access guidelines. Print copies of the guidelines, of course, are available. So for your copy, please call or email me directly. I would be delighted to follow up with anyone who would like to discuss these guidelines further. So please don't hesitate to get in contact. I would love to speak with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Emma Jane, for that introduction to the access guidelines, which is very appropriate at, at the beginning of the day. Um, a few things just strike me there, and I suppose parallels with uh, Rosemary's introduction about members. These guidelines are formed by the experiences, the lived experiences of people with disabilities, um, and from the 60 years experience of Irish Wheelchair Association working with uh, on behalf of people with disabilities. Um, it strikes me very much from what you're saying and the publications that you've shown there that the documents are there to support organisations, to support individuals, to improve accessibility in people's individual lives, but also in the communities in which we live. So I hope they're very much seen as a resource um, by all our influencers here on the call. Um, one thing that struck me very much in what you're saying there is about the power, that the good access has power and has power to open up opportunities for people um, and power to support people to access education, to access employment, to access housing, to participate in their communities and to socialise. It's as simple as that, it's about living lives. So thank you, Emma Jane, for that. At this point, I just want to remind people that if you wish to, if you have questions for any of the speakers, to use the Q&A icon on the top right hand side of your screen. Um, and also just to explain that uh, Emma Jane wasn't gone for coffee there and um, it was a delay, <laughs> a reality of the, the virtual presentations which we're, we're working on. So um, if you just bear with us um, on that foot. Next up we have joining us uh, Michael Hennessy Cullen and Leona Tuck um, and we're talking about the lived experience again. So this couple are based in Wexford uh, and they're going to tell us in their own words, it's a pre-recorded um, presentation and the picture quality um, isn't the best, so you needn't adjust your screen, but the, the, um, you'd hear very clearly and um, their experiences, the highs and lows of their navigation around Ireland and indeed internationally. Um, and their, their work as advocates for the association, or sorry, sorry, for the sector, for people with disabilities around access uh, in the environment and their social media campaigns. So the lived experience. So, and um, thanks to Michael and to Leona. Hi, I'm Leona. And I'm Michael. And together we are The Struggle Is Wheel. So before we get started, we just want to say a massive thank you to the IWA for inviting us to this webinar to speak. And um, we're very excited about the, the launch of the fourth edition of the access guidelines. We ourselves have the third edition, the hard copy of the third edition always on our desk uh, for reference point. And we also have the great outdoors guide as well that we keep uh, close by. So um, yeah, accessibility, as you can tell, is very important to us. Yeah, I guess why uh, 
Access guidelines are so important to us is because I'm a full time wheelchair user following a road traffic accident where I acquired a spinal cord injury. And um, yeah, that was 15 years ago. So um, since then, I suppose my life has changed a little bit. So I wouldn't have been as aware of things back then. And now, uh, access, you know, it's vital for me to live a fulfilling life. So basically, um, our account name, The Struggle is Real, is a play on that term, The Struggle is Real, which historically is actually linked to uh, oppression uh, and kind of everyday uh, frustrations and struggles. So um, we just thought we'd uh, change real to wheel and instead just document, uh, I guess, the highs and lows of accessibility. Um, and we thought maybe what better way to do that than to use social media as our outlet. So uh, the struggles wheel kind of kicked off January this year. We started it, yeah, started this year in January. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, but long before that, we were always taking the odd photo here and there um, of, of certain experiences we have. Um, so I guess uh, after a hike, we were up in Sligo in 2019. Yeah, yeah near Ben Bulwin. Yeah, the right of the mountain. And uh, I guess this was one of the kind of um, experience that motivated us to to start the struggle as well as though we were finishing a five kilometer hike um, in the woods turned around to head back to the car park and, and met a, a fallen tree on the trail it was getting dark it was winter uh, we had much choice of going back to the mist was rolling in oh yeah mist was rolling Fall. in off the mountain and uh, visibility was dropping so I actually had no option but to lift up the tree for Mick to actually wheel under, which is really stressful and quite scary, but we survived. But we remember thinking, you know, we need to start recording these uh, instances that happened to us as a couple. Um, and then after that, our honeymoon, we uh, went to California and uh, just, we were blown away by the amount of inclusive tourism out there and accessibility. Uh, so we, we kind of said to ourselves, so why can't this be uh, kind of copied over? And, um, you know, I mean, we, we, we saw three star hotels better um, at the hotels. Oh. Yeah, the five star. So they were kind of uh, and realized, no, we need to actually use uh, social media as a platform to show people, um, you know, the different things we experience. And things so, have improved in our, like, I'm 15 years in the chair and things have improved but not at a rate that you want to you know we're still lagging behind when you look at other places. Yeah so I mean yeah accessibility means a lot to us it's everything it's the difference between a restrictive uh, day out or having a memorable day out um, and it's in all aspects of life so and, and along with Michael if, if something is not accessible to, to him it's not accessible to me either. It's secondary discrimination. Yeah, it has an, as well. a knock on effect, which, you know, it's not it's not great for us as a couple, you know, to be wanting to go for a dinner and suddenly you see steps in front of you going into the restaurant. Well, what do we do then? You know, sometimes we can book, make a booking and they say it's accessible and we get there and it's not really accessible. You know, it's, it's the guidelines are needed for this. So, yeah, so just getting back to our Instagram account, which is kind of the main um, out of that we use initially. And um, they also are on Twitter, little plug there. But uh, yeah, just to kind of show uh, the different or our favorite activities that we like to do as a couple um, that involve accessibility. Um, I guess, you know, woodland walks, you'll see that on our Instagram. Uh, we're always rating different tracks and trails. And uh, that can also be coastal walks as well, coastal cliff walks. We love the sea, we love nature, we love the woods. And we're lucky that we live beside boat areas mm. um, and also just like regular couple things like going for coffee you know we love going to different cafes as well and um, so you know accessible or cafes is quite important. into a pub for a quick point of Guinness or something. It's on a hike as well it's if you can. Yeah. So but if these places are not accessible you know we're not able to experience the same levels of social activity like a normal couple I suppose we would say. Yeah so I mean walking our dog as well it's it's um it's all relevant you know we bring her as much as possible wherever we can go and um, but yeah they're kind of the main things that we like to to, to, to do as a couple going out and about so coffee and a good walk and um, 
so yeah uh, good access i guess uh we do promote good access on our instagram it's not all negative it's important to be really positive about our experiences as well and to um to, to kind of let businesses know as well that they're, they're on the right track um, which is also why the guidelines are important because you know just free download and um, they're a handy little link to add to an email if you are getting in touch with a business or an organization about accessibility that's what we love about the IWA guidelines and um, you know it's no excuse it's a free download and um, but yeah good access I guess from a hiking perspective there's there's three things we look out for um, and the first would be parking you know to see designated wheelchair parking um, at uh, the start of the Woodland Trail and um, it's really important and um, you know it shows as well that um, community groups are realizing that wheelchair users can hike as well with new technology these days and we'll get into that as well with the machines we use um, so accessible parking on arrival um, and then entrances, the next one, accessible entrances and hikes is really, really important. And uh, it's a very uh, common obstacle that we encounter. So we'll show you images of that now shortly in a second. And then trail terrain. Yeah, um, as long as it's good and compact, the surface is not the big massive boulder stones. We like gravel, gravel yeah. Um, we like good compact surfaces that easy for chairs to push obviously but I have the trike which makes my chair more uh, easier to navigate with power electric power so yeah it's, it's very important to have the trails very accessible so we'll show you some images now in a second uh bad access you know would be the classic uh, for hikes the styles that are used uh, to prevent quad bikes uh scramblers and horses to access trails but you know it uh it negatively affects wheelchair use as well, you know, discriminates them. So we're just going to show you some images. Um, I'm going to share screen, Mick. Sure, just yeah. checking here, guys, so I don't lose you. Go into PowerPoint. Hopefully everyone can and see share, that. Share, yeah. share. Do, 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 do. bear with us for a second. So um, from beginning, then you've got, um, sorry. Oh, I have to go back. Oh God, this always happens. Technology. I think we'll just go from here. Really. Yeah. yeah. Or from here. Okay, here we are. So, um, this was our first photograph that we used, kind of launching, you know, uh, the struggles wheel on social media. Uh, here you can see uh, Mick using the clip-on motor for his wheelchair, and we're at the summit of Sleep Quilchet, historical hill not far from us. Um, so yeah, that was kind of our, our start off photograph, just to show people yeah. that we can. And this something. probably would be accessible if to push, but it would be a massive struggle and it just wouldn't be enjoyable. So that's where the, uh, it's called the uh, roll racing street jet. And that's basically a power adaption that clicks onto your chair and it gets you to places where I definitely wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. Yes, yeah, so the company is all racing, all racing but the clip on motor is the type of design. And this is the uh, trail at Sligo we were talking about, where we turned a corner and we were met with uh, a fall in Scots Pine. Um, so thank God it was a juvenile, I was able to lift it up, but it was still really, really stressful. You only had been in the gym for a few months now for that. <laughs> uh, what else have we got? We've got uh, California. So this is what we saw in California, just an example of what we post on social media. Um, of an extended picnic table. These are becoming more popular in Ireland. We're coming across a few more of them around woodland trails. Um, but um, it really is important just to show how an extended plank of wood can make a picnic yeah. bench more accessible. Such a simple idea, yes. You know, it can make the difference of someone in a wheelchair enjoying a picnic with their family, you know, and not seeing, feeling excluded, being away from the bench, you know, and kind of not being interacting with people around. I mean, these, these should be compulsory. Really, yeah. you know? What's a great idea? Simple. Yeah, really good idea. And I think we have more guys. This is OK. So this was a uh, St. Anne. What's the St. Anne Valley Walk? Anne's Valley Walk, Anne's Valley sorry. Walk, Anne's Walk, Anne's Walk, Valley Walk. Yeah, County Waterford. Um, and it's a, a push swing uh, gate. Um, and it's just so easy for a wheelchair user because you can come out e either way you know, and you just push through and it swings back. Oh, yeah, so yeah. this was one of our favorite trails, one of the best accessible trails we've been on. And um, so you had accessible parking, you had information for wheelchair users on a trail map of the very start, which is uh, something you really don't see much mm -hmm. of in Ireland. 
Um, you can see the terrain is compact stone and the push pull gates as well, which is recommended in the access guide as well. It's great to have that chapter on it. Um, and every bridge was accessible as well. And they have viewing platforms that had a low barrier. So, you know, usually to be up high in your, in your island. So it's great to see, you know, they had taught pretty much of everything. Really good example. And uh, not so good was quilches. These are the classic styles that we encounter a lot of the time to um, stop uh, antisocial behaviour. So, I mean, we understand uh, they don't want scramblers on trails, but I mean, there has to be a better way to do this. Um, yeah, and the, the problem here as well is the inconsistency with their access um, areas, you know, their entrance gates and all, like that could be inaccessible and you go to the next one, maybe uh, another access gate and it's accessible, you know, there's no set guidelines for them for width and, and uh, gap and depth. You know, it's just so frustrating because, you know, just to, if they stuck to the one way of designing their entrances, well, everyone would be able to get in and then it's up to the user whether they can uh, navigate the terrain, you know, they're not thinking outside the box that people would, uh, disabilities can access these areas maybe. Sometimes we do actually squeeze through certain uh, versions of these styles, but you know, we always think to ourselves, well, what about mobility scooters and electric chairs, you know? So um, it is a big concern. And we are asking for, for Quilcha to develop some kind of access audit on these sites and, and work with community development projects. Um, but, uh, you know, at least they could do for now, even is upload images of their entrances on their website. Mm -hmm. So because the ordnance survey maps that these <clears throat> that quilts upload on their websites don't show any um, photograph of the actual entrance. So it's really kind of something where you just rock up and see if you can get in or not. And what's so frustrating is that many a time we've rocked up and we've been uh, blocked by these dials, but we can see right in front of us an accessible trail. So it's really, really frustrating. So we'll just go back out of there for now. Stop share. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, back so there are just some examples of kind of good access, bad access, and you yeah, know, but technology, the way technology has moved on now. So I uh, got this um, clip on motor about five years ago, yeah. and it really has changed the way we get out and about now. You know, I would have been able to push a little bit of them places, but now this opening a new world to me. So access, or sorry, technology is moving on all the time, mm -hmm. and I think planners and developers really need to move on with that and think you know they're probably coming to these places and thinking well you know it doesn't have to be accessible because wheelchair users won't be able to use these trails anyway they wouldn't be able to get up there that's changing now with this um, technology moving on so yeah uh, clip on motors are amazing and um, i mean they are very expensive that's another issue i guess to talk about but, yeah, but, um, day, yeah but they are an absolute game changer for wheelchair users you know and, and for couples and families yeah well. So that's um, that's uh, kind of what we're about. We're about inclusive tourism and, you know, accessible travel. Um, and we also will be kind of, we do share about inclusive cycling as well, because uh, Mick have ordered a hand cycle, mm -hmm. which will arrive next week. And, um, you know, and again, with the clip on motor, I can cycle alongside them. So inclusive cycling is something we're looking at too. Um, so, so yeah. That's really the kind of the team that we work with with our social media. Um, but we, we also kind of branch out as well, like the guidelines themselves. The guidelines talk about, you know, not just parks, you know, they talk about hotel rooms, uh, parking. Parking is a big issue with us. Um, ATM, ATM machines, yeah, the height of ATM machines. Yeah. Like there's absolutely everything in this guide and it's so easy to read. You just pick up any chapter and have a look at it. I mean, um, I guess it's not for us to learn off by heart, it's up to the planners and the architects and the engineers to know about this. Mm. But for us, it's handy for us if we're on Twitter maybe and we're trying to get a point across. We only deal with facts, you know, and, and lived in experiences. So this is a handy kind of reference point, a reference book for that. Um, but I guess the biggest improvement in accessibility that we've seen in Ireland. Um, Definitely new, um, you know, say pubs that are getting renovations and all, they definitely are thinking more about putting in maybe a pub that wouldn't have um, wheelchair tiles. Now when they're renovating their wheelchair tiles going in, ramps may be going in. You know, so the people are getting more aware of it, which is good. Yeah, uh, pathways. Pathways, footpaths now, yeah. the dishing maybe. And um, yeah, so it definitely is improving. It is improving, but there's a lot of more work to be done. Yeah. 
which is why I mean, this is the guy that's being relaunched again. And um, I guess, as Mick was saying, another big improvement uh, <clears throat> is the actual uh, technology end of things, you know. Um, with the clip on motors, they, they really do make a massive difference. Um, but we'd still like to see a lot of a lot of changes in the future, yeah. In the future. Um, I guess one of my pet peeves is parking. Uh, a big change we'd like to see is just even paintwork on our parking bays. Mm. They're really, really bad in a lot of places. They all need to be refreshed. We're seeing brand new paint used for uh, electric car charger point bays, but not for our own wheelchair parking bays. Yeah. So um, painting of our parking bays needs to be revamped dramatically. Um, and I guess with COVID this year, we can't do a presentation and not mention the COVID mobility trials uh, taking place all around our town and the cities in Ireland and England. This concerns England as well, but um, we, if we're being honest, when it comes to accessibility, we were um, appalled to see our bays used uh, for alfresco dining and uh, for them to be tarmacked over and relocated further away from you know mm -hmm. kind of the main shopping streets in Dublin and this involves Limerick as well, Cork, uh, Cork had a big issue with it as well. Uh, we're actually on the radio station uh, on Cork 98 FM about this, about the pedestrianisation of streets <clears throat> and the knock-on effects it has on a bad relocation of disabled parking bays. So, that, that is a major issue at the moment. We'll show you some photographs of that that we took this year, what was going on with our bays. Um, and also cycle lanes. We're delighted that the Access Guidelines Support Edition has brought up a chapter of cycle lanes um, because it's really important to know that bays have been displaced with the rolling out of cycle lanes. And uh, actually, we'll just get to it now and show you two yeah, photographs yeah, of it. Yeah. yeah. So again, guys, sorry. So share screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, PowerPoint, sure, and share. And, da, da, da. and I'm just going to go straight to down here. Yeah, is that good? From beginning. And from, yeah. Well, then it'll, then no, it'll no, go from no, beginning. No. Kind of like. So, uh, this is an example, guys, just to round up on uh, Serran Street uh, with uh, the COVID mobility trials. <clears throat> we understand that. Businesses need to uh, think outside the box to survive, but uh, if you're a wheelchair user, you know how hard it is to get parking around uh, Dublin City, you know, near Grafton Street uh, or any of those streets, Henry Street and so on. So this is a photograph I took on the 1st of August at uh, CR Bay's used on the, on the right hand side for dining and, and then to be tarmacked over. OK, so there's not enough dialogue about this on social media, you know, from politicians and so on about this. It is quite disconcerting to see um, because there is kind of lack of communication and around the plans of relocation of this. And it's kind of a bit like playing, uh, you know, reshuffling deck cards with our bays. And the bays they're replacing with are just not up a good enough standard. No, we're still not seeing drop curves as well and access styles. Um, again, cycle lanes then, just to show, uh, this is a photograph I took out in Sea Point Avenue, just past Black Rock. This was also uh, found in Dunleary. OK, so we originally had disabled parking bay along the, uh, the path. They have been brought out in the middle of the row, sandwiched between a contraflow, cycle lane and a one way traffic system. So this caused a lot of uproar and they have gotten rid of the symbol now and just made an ordinary bay. And I don't know where it's been re relocated to, but this is a big concern. Now, Mick and I partake in inclusive cycling. We love to cycle together as a couple. This is not anti cycling, but this is an issue. I'd like to know is what planner or you know, engineer decided this would be a, a good wheelchair bay in the first place with a pole right bang in the middle of it. For, say I parked in there as a driver, how am I going to get out there? You know, and people are putting these um, spots in place thinking, I that's, that's a good wheelchair spot. It's crazy. I think there's an assumption the more parking you see that people are assuming, or engineers so on, are assuming that if you're a wheelchair user, you either, um, you know, you're a passenger, you're not a driver. Uh, you can yeah. drive. Yeah. They can drive, hand controls. A lot of wheelchair users can drive. So you have to think of the door wingspan of a driver as well as a passenger. And um, so. But this is not to bash engineers around either, but it just shows the lack of thinking sometimes that goes into things like this and such a debilitating thing then on a driver with a disability um, that can ruin their, 
or they really don't, they're going about their business, you know, it's just a little bit more thought has to go into things like this because it's so important. Yeah, so um, that draws the end of our little PowerPoint. So I'll just stop, share this one here. Okay, so I hope that was uh, helpful uh, into the glimpse of the struggle is real. And uh, again, we want to say a massive thank you to the IWA yeah, for giving for us this chance to talk about issues talk. around Ireland. And uh, we look forward to the questions and answer panel later yeah. on. Thanks. Right. Thanks very much. Bye. No, so thank you to, to Michael and Leona for that presentation. When you showed the image there of the empty wheelchair at the style, it reminded me of a conversation I had yesterday with um, Oliver Murphy, our, our founding member. And uh, I quote, he says, we want to be part of the community we live in. We want to move about freely and we want to contribute to society. So it just it came to mind there in the middle of that. Um, thanks very much for that lived experience, uh, Michael and Leona. One of the things that struck me was how life can change for anybody. And also suddenly, in your case, 15 years ago, uh, as the result of the, the road traffic accident, Michael, and the impact that that has had on your, on your life. Um, I love the play on the struggle is real, uh, the struggle is wheel. Um, we we'll all remember that, I think, and encourage everybody to, to log on. Um, one of the things that struck me in your presentation as a couple was that the, the impact not only for the person with the disability, but also on, on their family, on their friends, um, in terms of you, you referenced there going, going to the pub or going out for something to eat. Um, and that also drew me in my mind to the whole notion of contribution to society and the spending power of people with disabilities and their their families and their, their friendships and all of that. So people are losing out a lot by uh, their environments or their businesses not being accessible. I have to con um, you know, compliment you and your positivity around, um, I suppose, all the successes and acknowledging the improvements um, across uh, society in terms uh, of access and the importance, and I agree with you, the importance of recognising areas of best practice. And uh, again, just to finish on the note of the, the two documents that um, we were shown earlier by Emma Jane, the Great Outdoors uh, and alongside the IWA Best Practice Guidelines. Um, they're very complimentary and I'd encourage everybody or the influencers out there watching this um, to get your hands on both copies and see what difference you can make to society. Um, and of course, we can't lose the point. Uh, I'll take it as, as advice from Leona that we should be all going to the gym and keeping fit. You don't know when you'll need that. Um, so next, as we move on, I'd like to introduce you to Fanula Rogerson, an um, architect. I met Fanula, I think, a year ago at the National um, Housing Conference, the Irish Council for Social Housing. And I think it was down in Wexford uh, we met. And I was really taken by her very clear passion uh, for access, which will become very clear in our pre-recorded um, um, presentation to us here. So Fanula has over 30 years experience of as principal of Fanula Rogerson Architects and she's won awards in housing, in urban and inclusive design. She's the former vice president of the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland um, and she's a member of the Universal Design Task Force. And Fanula also lectures in universal design and is an examiner in architectural professional practice at the National University of Ireland. Um, so we'll move on now to, so as I say, roll it there, Ross.
on the off chance that you can hear me, I just apologising for the slight delay, um, such as broadband width across the country. Um, we'll be tuned shortly. Morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me here today uh, at the launch of the Best Practice Access Guidelines by IWA. I'm really delighted to be able to join you. Uh, I was asked to say just a little bit about how my interest in accessibility came about, and I guess it's been something that's been in my life from the very beginning. Um, I grew up essentially with two parents with a disability. My mother is the little girl on the right hand side in between two other children, her brother and sister, and um, she was one of the big family. But you can see uh, she has a, her leg in a plaster cast at that stage at the age of five, and she had that leg amputated um, in her late teens. So throughout my life, um, I always uh, considered disability to be pretty well normal, and um, my father had one as well. So by the time I had qualified from architecture, um, I, I think the first book I bought after qualifying was this book on the left hand side here, Designing the Disabled by Selwyn Goldsmith, which was some 600 pages of guidance on making the built environment more accessible. A lot of things have changed since then, many more haven't. And in fact, when you go back to look at it, it, it still has some very relevant information in it today. And um, soon after I ended up doing some work with Tom Page in the National Rehabilitation Board on a, a, a pilot study on house adaptations where we wanted to make a case to the Department of Environment that there was insufficient funding for people available in order to adapt houses. So we did 12 house adaptations which were monitored very clearly the costs were and then the case was made to the department to increase the funding. So from that early stage I guess I had an interest in uh, housing, accessible housing and house adaptations. In 1991 the first edition of part um, of the building regulations was published. This was a very minimal document with just 15 pages of guidance um, which primarily dealt with access into the building ramp and steps and having a sanitary facility within the building, as well as some very limited guidance on audience and spectator facilities. Um, but during the 90s, the Commission on the Status of Disabilities, which I think was what really put things into perspective for many of us, um, met over a period of years and in 1996 launched the report, um, A Strategy for Equality. And in that report, there were several pages of recommendations in relation to access and in relation to housing. If we go back to that, at that stage in 1996, the Commission was recommending lifetime adaptable housing in across all housing tenures. In parallel, uh, Disability Action in Northern Ireland was uh, was was uh, developing guidance for lifetime adaptable housing. And also in the UK, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and Habenteg Association were both developing guidance uh, for together for, for accessible housing and adaptable housing. In Ireland, the was at the time an interest in, in uh, in a, 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 a housing for commitments out to start, including the regeneration of Ballymun. And the residents were all in homes. We were fortunately working with BRL at the time on a number of schemes. So because of our interest in adaptability and accessibility, we decided to try and apply these guidelines as best we could to the briefs that we were getting for new schemes. This is a scheme in, in uh, Dolman Court in Ballymun where we worked hard with um, both the, the architects in BRL but also with the local residents and the tenants who were going to be going into the houses in terms of ensuring that they were as adaptable as possible. And in fact, those schemes that did 
uh, apply these standards tended to be very much in demand by people when it came to choosing where they were to live. So the three bedroom houses had, um, had ground floor bedrooms, ground floor shower rooms, there was good circulation space, they all had level access. And don't forget, this was before the building regulations for visible housing actually came into place. Um, and they were, they, were, they were successful in such as such um, at that time. Um, at the same time, we were also doing a scheme in Chapel Lizard for Clueth Housing Association on an extremely difficult site with a fall of about 15 metres from one side to the other of the site on a very narrow site. It was almost deemed impossible to develop the site. And again, we took this up as a challenge to see, could we actually design a scheme of accessible houses on this steeply sloping site? In the end, we uh, built 36 homes on the site. 32 of these were visitable, all of them were adaptable, and we achieved six wheelchair accessible uh, dwellings, all of which were integrated into the main scheme. The, uh, they were a mix of single and two-story houses, some apartments uh, and some duplexes over the apartments, and they were grouped around three courtyards. This, the bungalows at the entrance of the courtyards were all, um, they were still being designed to very, very small standards, but they were accessible. Um, and we had also allowed space at the edge of each of the bungalows for expansion, should that be necessary, in order to create a more accessible uh, dwelling for somebody who needed assistance. This was our typical wheelchair accessible house um, with only 63 square meters, which nowadays would hardly be considered accessible at all. But we managed to demonstrate that it was possible for somebody who was reasonably independent to be able to use one of these houses. And they had a choice of whether to have open plan kitchens and bedrooms uh, with bathrooms or shower rooms either en suite or separately accessed. As it turned out, one of the tenants um, before moving in actually had quite a significant disability and we were able to extend the house to one side, increase the storage space that he needed within the house, make his bedroom en suite with the bathroom and give him a good open plan kitchen, dining, living room. Even the smaller two-storey houses were considered in terms of how they might be adaptable. We identified places for through floor lifts, um, adequate circulation in the hallways, uh, straight flight stairs in order to accommodate stair lifts, should that be necessary in the future, and the main bedroom uh, with a future possible opening between the bedroom and the bathroom. The following year, um, the minister launched a document, a consultation document on uh, the new proposed technical guidance document to Part N. In the launch and at the, at the launch, the Minister actually suggested that lifetime adaptability was now to become the norm and that it was no longer really about access for people with disabilities, but it was about access for everybody. Together with the NRB, the RIAI and 17 organisations came together to make a submission in relation to the guidance that was uh, contained in this consultation document. We made a case that the uh, guidance should be, uh, should be basically spread out over all the other building regulations, that we should mainstream and the technical guidance, what we now know as part M, that it should be mainstreamed into all the other building regulations, that sh there shouldn't be special provision for people with disabilities. It should be about access and use for everybody. A number of recommendations were made as to how this could be done. And above all, we recommended that lifetime adaptable housing should form part of the new technical guidance document M uh, uh, to be published soon after that. Unfortunately, the document was published in 2000. It was still access for people with disabilities. Uh, it was still only visitable housing. 
there were no lifetime standards and there were no standards for wheelchair accessible dwellings. Around the middle of 2000 and 2005, um, the NDA commissioned a study to review the effectiveness of Part N because there was a lot of evidence at this stage that it wasn't a, a, an effective uh, instrument in order to achieve an accessible built environment. What was found was that there was guidance, very limited guidance, that the guidance that was there was ineffective, that it wasn't understood and it wasn't applied. There were no regulations for the external environment or the spaces between buildings. Focus was primarily on mobility with very limited guidance for other people that may need, have, 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 have need a more accessible environment. Standards were too low. Uh, particularly though it was a level of non-compliance that was widespread across the country and virtually no enforcement. And the recommendations from that review was that a multi-pronged approach was needed if we were to uh, make progress in terms of creating more accessible built environments. So towards the end of the 2000s, we had of course the Disability Act, then we had the introduction of disability access certificates. Very unfortunate in my view that if they were called disability access certificates because basically it, 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 it kept part M in the realm of disability rather than mainstreaming it and making it about access and use of buildings. The following year, part M 2010 was published and now at last it became access and use for everyone. It was based on a universal design approach the guidance was greatly expanded. We had gone now from a document of 15 pages in, in 1991 to a um, document that extended to 125 pages in, 19, in, in 2010. And the guidance was much better and in no small part due to the work of IWA and Dolores Murphy, who I recall working on a committee that was making submissions to the department at the time and really making a very, very strong case for the increase of the basic circulation uh, standard of 1500 by 1500 to 1800 by 1800. And this is still one of the better standards across Europe. And I, I think that is great thanks is due to Dolores for that. But here we are again in 2010, visitable housing is still there in the regulation no significant change, nothing for adaptability and nothing for uh, wheelchair accessible housing. In the meantime, over the last 10 years, we've had a number of guidance documents published, uh, particularly the most notable probably by the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, who published um, Building for Every Everyone, an updated version of it in 10 volumes. They've also published design guidelines for homes in Ireland. Um, which in essence are good practice, non-prescriptive guidance, which are aimed at inspiring people to think differently. And um, they've also published guidance on dementia friendly dwellings. And there was a guide on design for mental health published by the HSE and the housing agency. Um, so there's no doubt that standards and guidelines are extremely important. We have a new European standard, which we hope to see published in the next year or so on access and use of the built environment. That will be in three parts, functional, uh, technical, and uh, a, a, a technical report on conformity assessment. There's also an updated issue of the international standard ISO 21542 for access and use of the built environment. And there are some proposed standards from the British Standards Institute, one for inclusive residential neighbourhoods and homes and another one for sensory and neurological needs. But as well as standards, we need regulation. And with good regulation, we need monitoring enforcement, plus a commitment to education and training. And it is there, I think, that this latest edition of the IWA's best practice access guidelines really comes into play. You have successfully over the last 11 years produced access guidelines which have been constantly reviewed and updated and kept in line with current thinking with regards to universal accessibility. You've had an amazing consultation process with well over 500 of your members 
that have been consulted in uh, on the guidance in this new document. I found it incredibly clear, easy to understand, very user friendly, and have noticed a lot of improvements which have happened incrementally across each of the four editions. This particular edition I notice has guidance on electric car charging, which of course wouldn't have been there in the first and earlier editions. It has guidance on all the facilities that any ordinary person would expect to find um, and need access to. Hair and beauty salons, a new one added this time, medical facilities, student accommodation, places of worship, and also updated um, guidance on changing places. And of course, changing places are one of the most important things that we need now to find everywhere across the country. Um, I read recently that there are now over 1500 changing places in England and only 15 so far registered in Ireland. And again, I would like to thank IWA and Dolores Murphy particularly for all the help in uh, applying these standards and in the registration of, of uh, facilities as they become more commonplace now here. And of course, I would encourage you all to sign the petition, which is currently out by Changing Places Ireland in order to uh, encourage Changing Places to become part of the mandatory requirements for, for, for buildings across the country. So just to finish, I would like to say that the guidance for accessible housing that you have included in your best practice guidelines is a very welcome addition to the guidance available here in Ireland. It's excellent, clear, comprehensive. It covers wheelchair housing and apartments. It's been well illustrated with drawings and images of this lovely scheme in Belmullet on Freya, which really is an example to all housing associations of how simple and easily accessible housing can be designed and built. And of course, it was an award winner in 2019 in the Irish Council for Social Housing Awards. So well done, IWA. Uh, well done on the fourth edition of your access guidelines and also on your 60th anniversary. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Fanula, for, for that uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, in particular, it's very interesting to, to hear the journey um, of part of the building regulations um, from that first edition of a few pages to 2010. Um, you know, the mind still boggles that 2010 and all we have is visitable housing um, in, the, in part of the building regulations. And I remember being at a meeting with my colleagues uh, in Linster House where we met, um, shall we say, high ranking officials and minister um, lobbying for um, more wheelchair accessible housing. And there was actually a belief um, that the building regulations catered for wheelchair accessible housing among some of the people that, that we met. Uh, you know, you wonder, do we actually need people who are wheelchair users to be in these positions that are making the decisions that are, that are influencers? Because at the end of the day, you're not talking when you're talking about housing or the built environment, it's very clear like you're not talking about luxury. You're talking about requirements for people to, to live independently. But anyway, that's work for, I suppose, another <laughs> another day. And um, very interesting on your Chapel Lizard presentation there um, to see the integration um, and the welcome integration into the bigger development uh, and the three courtyards of housing for people with disability and even the consultation um, with the individual who required additional space and all of that uh, and who better than himself to to influence that design. Um, so thanks for, Rula, for that and I know you're with us for um, questions and answers later. I just want to draw people's attention to the option of submitting questions on the Q&A on the top right hand side of your screen and also to bring your attention to the, the guidelines, and this was mentioned earlier by um, Leona, I think, who she referred to, we, no need to read the whole document. If you go, I encourage people to look at the contents um, sections um, of the document. Um, nobody would be expected to uh, memorize the, the volume of uh, information that's there to support people towards access. But at the, at the outset, um, housing, you go straight to 
section 10 and it starts at two, page 259 uh, and so it's divided into sections a useful tool there so we're moving on now um, i'd like to introduce you and again i believe we have a, a pre-recording um, and ask you to bear with us for any technical delays we might have here um, we have Gerard Quinn, who is Professor Emeritus of, Lo of Law at the University, National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, and he's currently Professor of Law at the University of Leeds and at the Wallenberg Institute in the University of London, Sweden. Um, Professor Quinn sits on the Scientific Committee of the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency. But we're particularly honoured to um, have Professor Quinn here today as he was recently appointed as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of People with Disability. So you're, you're very welcome, um, Professor Quinn. So roll it there, Ross. Thank you and good morning. And thank you indeed for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is Derek Quinn and I'm the incoming UN Special Rapporteur. Thank you and good morning and thank you indeed for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is Derek Quinn and I'm the incoming UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I know the Irish Wheelchair Association has a long and distinguished history and I'm really pleased to be with you today. Today is a very important day. The launch of the fourth edition of your access guidelines is a major step forward. Uh, I like the way the guidelines are evidence based coming from the community. This is as it should be. And I especially like your intention to engage with policymakers to see the guidelines embedded in public law and practice into the future. I will personally be sharing the guidelines with the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on Accessibility Maria Cisterna Soledad to make sure she's aware of them and especially as a model of good practice based on community engagement. I want to use the time to just reflect on two things briefly. First of all, I'm sure you don't need to be reminded the pandemic emergency is reshaping the ground rules. And I want to suggest to you that the exigency of a resilient and inclusive recovery, as the World Bank puts it, gives us an opportunity now to finally embed the rights of persons with disabilities at the heart of rebuilding our society and economy. First, I want to talk a little bit, of, and secondly, I want to talk a little bit about accessibility itself. We've been talking about it for years. Indeed, I recall long conversations with Frank Mulcahy years ago on it, may he rest in peace, but recently the nature of the conversation has changed. It's changed partly because we've gone behind it to stress personhood as a foundation stone for modern policy. And it's changed because it's no longer seen just as a technical challenge, but also now as a basic human right. First of all, the pandemic. There's now been extensive reports from around the world, from Disability Rights Monitor, Rising Flame in India, Outright Action International, that show the negative effects of COVID-19 on persons with disabilities. More accurately, they show the negative effect of policies in response to COVID-19. Most of the policy responses, at least in the initial emergency phase, vividly demonstrated the existence of an old model of disability based on charity. This led to preventive strategies that had the pernicious effect of stripping away services, rendering people with disabilities isolated and lonely, and caused, even in some countries, unfortunate confrontations with the police. It also caused a lot of unequal treatment with respect to the rationing of scarce medical treatment, and it has highlighted the extreme vulnerability of persons with disabilities in institutional environments. But the single most important takeaway is that if, if persons with disabilities and their representative organizations had been actively consulted from the get-go, then many of the predictable problems would not have happened or could have been better managed. To its great credit, the World Bank has emphasized the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable communities, including persons with disabilities, and especially people who through no fault of their own find themselves in vulnerable situations. The World Bank has lent its voice to those calling 
for a much more robust, resilient and inclusive recovery. The future cannot be like the past. What then about accessibility and its place in resilient recovery? The right to accessibility is now enshrined in Article 19 of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, a treaty Ireland has ratified along with the vast majority of UN states. But if you look at it, and if you want to see the root of title to Article 9, look to the concept of personhood that goes behind it. We often say that the chief distinguishing feature of the disability treaty is the move from treating people with disabilities to be objects to be managed towards subjects with inherent rights. That's the key, that's the foundational pillar. It's because of this commitment to personhood, regardless of disability or any other trait, that the accessibility provisions now spring to life. A commitment to personhood and the equal personhood of all forced the drafters to interrogate arbitrary blockages to the expression of humanity. The concept of accessibility suitably grounded on personhood forced us to come to terms with the personal dimensions to accessibility. I do remember when we recommended lifetime adaptable housing here in Ireland in the 1990s, nothing came of it. Ireland would be in such a different place today if this life cycle approach were taken back then. Maybe we couldn't articulate it fully back then. Maybe the forces arrayed against us were too strong, but all of that has changed now. The concept of accessibility suitably grounded on personhood also forces us to come to terms with the built environment and the many arbitrary blockages it presents. We have not done as well as we could. I've often been very impressed with the minutiae of US law in this regard. For example, there, it is illegal to have a doctor's premise, premises over a second floor without an elevator. It is illegal to have dense carpet in a hotel foyer. It is legal not to have a public information system uh, that isn't accessible to all. Half measures do not optimize economic rationality, they undermine it. And these days, the electronic environment is just as important as the built environment. We've made some headway on this with EU law, but we need to go much further. <clears throat> and the concept of accessibility, suitably grounded on personhood, forces us to challenge the myriad of other barriers facing persons with disabilities. A, a recent European Association of Service Providers conference focused on culture and the right of access to culture. They spoke of the right of self-expression of persons through artistic formats. They spoke of the right to access culture, art galleries, museums, etc. The recent Marrakesh Treaty opening up the world of books to visually impaired readers is a good start, but it needs to be built on. And they spoke of the right of persons with disabilities to be in the production ecosystem of culture as technicians, directors, and copy authors. In other words, accessibility has been reframed since the UNCRPD, not just as a technical challenge, but as an aspect of fundamental rights and especially personhood. And here's the thing, Accessibility is absolutely fundamental to a resilient and inclusive recovery. Human talent is evenly spread in society. We need everybody to be given the opportunity to rebuild. Building better should not remain a slogan and should not be confined to building the way we used to do. I wish you well in your deliberations. Do not be afraid to reframe accessibility and connect it to a much broader agenda. At the end of the day, this is both economically and socially rational, as well as the right thing to do. Build back better has to be much more than a slogan. Thank you very, very much. So thank you, Professor Quinn, uh, for those words and congratulations again on your appointment, um, which I'm sure is, is a recognition of your fantastic work um, uh, in the area of law and people with disabilities. And we really look forward to, I suppose, the future impact of your work uh, at an EU level. And it's great to hear that you'll be sharing um, IWA's best practice 
access guidelines um, in that forum. Uh, and don't forget there's two books, The Great Outdoors as well. So that would be very much appreciated. And we look forward to working with you. Uh, we're certainly on the same tune when you speak of the whole area of personhood, um, because that's what Irish Wheelchair Association is about. People again being at the heart uh, of everything we do. And your, your closing words there <laughs> remind me again of Oliver Murphy, our founding member, when he says, we want to contribute. People with disabilities have something to contribute to, to society, um, but the barriers need to be removed and people need to be supported uh, in terms of accessibility. So thank you very much for that. And again, I know you're present for um, our question and answers session, hopefully. So moving on next, um, I suppose, to the, the man himself, um, Dr. Oliver Murphy, who we say um, resides in the seat of wisdom at the age of 85 uh, years. Um, having been paralysed, as he says himself, at the age of 23, a long time ago. So in terms of lived experience, we really look forward um, to hearing the conversation between um, Oliver and John Fulham. Um, it, uh, Oliver was inspired very much by, by doctors back in the day um, who used sport as a way to combat depression um, for people who, who had a disability. And he took part in the first Paralympics, as he would explain himself, in Rome. And from then was born Irish Wheelchair Association 60 years ago today in the pillar room uh, of the Matter Hospital in Dublin. And today the organisation we're proud to say as the leading representative organisation for people with disabilities, physical disabilities in Ireland, has over 20,000 members, over two and a half thousand staff, over a thousand volunteers. Um, and uh, on that note, then, together with John Fulham, I can't leave John out, who is a four-time Paralympian. I see him smiling at me here on the screen. Um, and he's the president of Paralympics Ireland, but he's also the public engagement manager with Irish Wheelchair Association. So without further ado, I'll go back to Ross to roll it again, Ross. We have a pre-recording um, of the two guys in conversation. Hey Oliver, thanks a million again for being willing to chat to us. You always do, which is great, but it's good to catch up with you anyway. It's been a long time since I've seen you. You're looking well. I thank God. I'm going to show you. You're nice and brown and I have a little bit of sun. I, I sat at the front door. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really just want, I wanted to have a chat with you just, just to kind of put it in context about the importance of the access guidelines and just, just your thoughts and stuff. But where I'm going to start, Oliver, is, is to go back just to give people a little bit of perspective. Like you, you set up IWA when you came back from uh, the Paralympics in Rome in 1960. What was it like, Oliver? Give us a sense of what you saw when you went over there and, and when you came back. Yeah, well, John, the trip to Rome was very interesting and very enlightening. There was a man by the name of Frank Cahill, the manager of rehab at the time, and he picked the team to go to Rome, Father Leo, Jack Kerry and myself, Jimmy Levins, and Joan Horn. In Rome, we were picked up at the airport. The bus, that was an ordinary bus with the seats taken out of it, and you're just in there, no clamps, nothing safety, rolling around and things. The bus stopped suddenly, or was any kind of sudden jerk, you were, could be thrown out of the chair. There wasn't anything great about it. But anyway, we got to the Olympic Village, the same Olympic Village that the Olympians had been in about three weeks beforehand. Mm -hmm. And we were all dismayed when we saw it. Because they were all built up on stilts. You could walk underneath the buildings and there was no lift. So we were all kind of wondering how do we get into this place? And the, the, on the flight steps, there was plywood, flat plywood. The Italian army were on duty the whole time. So okay. they pushed us up, because there's no way you're making yourself, and uh, it was too steep, and pushed us up and into the rooms. And I was in the room with Father Leo. And, Jack was in the room, room with Jimmy Levins, and Joan was whatever the ladies were, with one of the most inaccessible accommodations <laughs> you'll find. Now that's, that's access, <laughs> or not access at the very best. <laughs> we spoke a lot to the different countries that was there, people, a lot of them speak English and that, and we found that quite a number of them had a much better setup. So when we came back, Father Leo and Jack and myself got together, Jack Kerrigan's house here in Prada, and talked about the situation. And of course, Father Leo was the driving force. He always wanted to do something. So he just decided in between us that we were going to see about setting up some kind of an organization that would help the people in Ireland who were in wheelchairs. 
it's a much fuller, better quality of life. So we, we organised the meeting in the pillar room in the Matter Hospital and uh, on that first night on the 10th of November in 1960. There were 10 of us in wheelchairs in the room, four of us who had been in Rome, Father Leo, Jack, Jimmy Levins and myself, and then there was, there was three Joes, Joe Domingan, Joe Davis and Joe Craven from Dada, and then mm -hmm. we one lady, Kay Hayes. Yeah. And, and Kay, and that from the eight, we started the whole thing going. We, we didn't know exactly what we were doing. We knew what we wanted to do. It seems that attitudes and access were really the big battles that you were fighting back then. If you look back at everything that IWA has achieved and what you achieved, how do you feel we've progressed as, as a society? Well, we definitely have made progress. We still have an awful lot to do. That's why these access guidelines are so important, that we just keep getting that message out there. We keep communicating to the people, you know, the people who plan and design and build, that I'd like to be able to go out my front door and do what I want to do, whatever it might be, education, recreation, go to a football match, go to the pub, if that's mm -hmm. at the cinema. But I, that I know that when I went out, I'd meet no obstruction. And our job is to try and make sure that they remember that we are also here. We want to be part of the communities we live in. We want to be able to kind of do the, the normal things that people do mm -hmm. and be contributors, or be part of what goes on. I feel that when we go there, it, 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 that's not always a battle. I was 85 there in July. Thank God, it's great to be as good as I am. And in 61 years, and a bit in the wheelchair. And it's a long time sitting around. Mm. But still, I, I, I feel I've contributed a good lot and that I've, I've helped to make things better. That, and that's really, that, that's what we said to do all those years ago. Maybe I was very blessed from the very beginning. But I, I never had a chip on my shoulder. I always yeah. had an outlook. Mm -hmm. Just about me, because that's who I know about the best. And I actually really got on with life. Yeah, and I did meet many obstacles. So we're on version four of the access guidelines now, and it's been created in consultation. And I think that's very important because see, everybody was brought in. A lot of work has gone in. It's a tool that's available to the world around us that we're giving to the world to and to the people around us to say, this is the best practice. This is the model standard that that will help you be truly inclusive and, and include everybody in whatever you do. So what would be the, if I was to say to you, one message that you would like to give out to people today, what would that one message be? We, we, we as people with disabilities, want to be able to go out into the world and move about freely, knowing that we're not going to be obstructed by something that was built by people, you know, for the want of proper planning and design. That's what we're trying to eliminate. You know, we can't move mountains or do things like that, but things that are built by people, which is everything. And uh, we, we think we should get to the stage where it can be done properly and that, that, that we can use them like everybody else. These access guidelines should be able to help people to achieve that, the people in the planning, designing, building, uh, and whether it be footpaths or intersections, um, pedestrian crossings. Uh, okay. that, it's so important that all of these things are done properly, done safely, and that we can actually get on with living our lives. And uh, again, I've said that a lot of times, but that really is the basis. Uh, to allow, that's what I think would be a main message, that, uh, that these access guidelines will help to get us there. Okay. And well, we'll that that on in. Thank you very much. I could say <laughs> talk to you all day and chat to you all day. Yeah. Um, and look, I'll say it to you again, Oliver, just thank you so much for the work that you've done to allow people like me to follow in your footsteps. And I think, oh. and I, I've, I will say it to you every time I meet you, um, because I do mean it when I say that I do, I do know that I am standing on the shoulders of giants I, and you're one of mine. Uh, thanks very much. John, that's, and although that's, I am only four foot three and a half, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a giant. You are a giant. Uh, no, thanks a million, because as that all we've been trying to do from the very beginning, as quite a bunch of characters who knew there was something 
needed to be done. We set about doing it and, uh, and it's developed into what what we have now, which is mighty. And, and, it's it's, and, and, that, the, and that, the, that the kernel of it all is still, it's still the person with a disability that we are catering for. And, and I know because of the way we're set up now that we have to have people at very high levels of, in, in the running of it and not to do it right and do it properly. But at the kernel of it all, we still, at the Irish Wheelchair Association, started 60 years ago for that sole purpose of improving the quality of life of people with disabilities in our country and hopefully all over the world. But that's really what we started set about doing and it developed and grew and that there's so many facets to it. It's, it's just unbelievable. But all of these facets have to be worked on continuously and to get them right and that they keep being done and that we know going backwards. Once we made progress, that we keep that progress and keep adding to it and keep adding, adding on it. I can look back and I'll just say Jack and Father Leo and Joe Craven and Joe Domigan and Joe Davis and Kay Hayes who are here now, my God, I'll tell you, who are, they'd be really, really very proud, as I am. And I'm very proud of how, how we started it, but of, of how people have come in over all the years and have done so much to make it better and improve it and develop it and, and still hold on to that core value, which we must never let go of. That we're here working to help these people to help themselves and to get on with life. Whatever they see is the, their pathway in life, whatever they see is what they want to do, that by our efforts and what we do, that would make it possible for them. So big, big thank you there to, to Oliver and John. What an amazing man. And you could see the joy in his face there, I think, as he was recalling all his colleagues who stood in 60 years ago in, in the Matter Hospital in at the foundation of, IW, of IWA. A few things that just strike me in what he said there was, don't let things be an obstacle that are built by people. Um, and that we want to be part of the community. We want to move about freely and we want to contribute. And one of us, and I leave it at this point, he said something needed to be done and we set about doing it 60 years ago. And what an achievement um, over the 60 years of the impact on the lives of, of people with disabilities. So thank you everybody there. Um, again, apologies if there's any delays as we move through the, the virtual world. Um, and I'm taking this that at this point we have um, a number of questions. I'm very conscious of time, so we're limited. Um, but if we have we any questions on that? Hi Tony, yes, we have a question in here for John Fulham. Who should use the guidelines and at what stage in the development process should they be used? Okay, thank you. Um, I would suggest that those who use the guidelines are anybody uh, who is making, uh, who is building or making an adjustment to their to their built premises. Obviously, while it's aimed at designers and architects, I think it's such a, an easy and usable format that anybody who is considering making a change should take up this document and and look at it, understand what it means, and then pass it on to those who are who are designing the changes for them. Um, the document is designed so that everybody can use it, and it is truly accessible in that format. So that would be, it's open for everybody, while aimed specifically at as probably those those designers and, and architects. But that's who I would suggest would, would use it. Thanks very much, John. Emma, have we any any more? Yes, there's a question here for Rosemary. Why are the guidelines required? Thank you for that, Emma. That's one of those how long have you got answers, but I'll, I'll try and make it as brief, I suppose, as I possibly can. You know, we've heard today from John, from Oliver, from Mick and Leona, there are still huge barriers for people with disabilities every day in accessing the built environment, both internal and external in their communities, in our transport, in our cities. 
And I think, you know, when we listen to Oliver tell the story of how he and his friends formed this organization 60 years ago, and, and their mission was to really improve the quality of life for people with physical disabilities. And then we roll forward to 2020 and we hear Mick and Leona talking about, you know, the disabled parking bays being moved during COVID to make way for alfresco dining. There's an awful lot of work still to be done. And this goes way beyond, you know, building regulations, part M, what builders, developers, cafe owners and society as a whole needs to do. We still have a huge societal shift that's needed here. And our guidelines of, and they, you know, our, our guidelines are called the best practice access guidelines. And I think what, what I'm really thrilled about with this edition is how accessible those guidelines are themselves. Anybody could pick this document up, dip in and dip out and, you know, use it in their business, in their project, in their plan. So there's a huge amount of work still to be done. And that's why the guidelines are required. Mm. I think we all need to ask ourselves, Rosemary, are we an influencer and can we use them to make a change in our work? Absolutely, Tony, I fully agree. And I think it's it's not ask ourselves, are we an influencer, but tell ourselves to be influencers. I'd like to take it even further than that. So true. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, the next question in is for Mick and Leona. Uh, what is the most positive impact on your lives of the best practice access? Yeah, what's that? Well, basically like, um, getting out and about in everyday life and not having obstacles in front of you. So be it, you know, ramps going into pubs or wheelchair accessible toilets in any um, building you're in. But basically, like like Oliver was saying in his video clip there, about getting out and living your life um, as hassle free as possible. I think also it's, it's just good to know that the IWA have our back, literally. You know, to have this uh, guide uh, as a reference point and mm. um, at home, you know, it's good to know that these uh, points are, are have been put together and are made into a book. So, um, you know, because sometimes we might doubt ourselves with certain things, but um, there's one thing we forgot to mention as well, just with, with um with the IWA and accessibility with technology, a new thing that has made a great improvement is teaming up with petrol stations for um, refueling. Yeah, yeah, on the phone. That's really like as a driver with disability, you know, it's possible. You know, like getting your chair in now is a bit of a an ordeal. Well, not an ordeal, but it, it can be hassle, especially in rain. A four courses can't be covered. But with the app, you just click, simply click on it, and it's mainly with Apple Green at the moment. But it's a brilliant app. Just click on it. They'll come out and fill up your car, give them your cash, and away you go. You know, it's it's just one less hassle. So that's another positive thing that's yeah. been um, added to the kind of area of accessibility with the IWA. Wonderful, thank you. Emma, over to you again. Uh, the next one I think is for Emma Jane. Um, IWA have built wonderful independent living houses in Belmullet, Bel which have given seven members the best possible accessible housing experience. How can we ensure and encourage the public sector and private sector to use our guidelines and ensure good access becomes a part of everybody's priority? Um, thanks very much, Emma. Um, yeah, I had the privilege actually of visiting the, seeing the housing in Belmullet and it's really so outstanding and, and such an example. Um, I suppose there's lots of ways in which people watching can try to, uh, well should uh, and can influence uh, public policy and public uh, decision makers. There's lots of things you can do, like Leona and Michael are doing, get involved in a social media campaign, campaign and promote the issues that you are having. Uh, create networks of people of similar advocates such as Leona and Michael and, and get together and there are really is power in numbers. Um, if you see an issue in your locality, contact your local authority, get in touch with your local access officer, um, get in touch with your local councillors, your TDs, your senators and highlight issues to them. Uh, they want to know they're working for you, so they want to hear from you. And there are some great websites such as whosmytd.e where you can find your local authority members, local councillors and TDs and find out how to contact them. Um, if you ever want to get in touch with myself, I'd be happy to take on board any recommendations or issues that you've seen. And, and I would also be able to happy to chat with you and think about the ways in which we can try and influence together. Particularly, for instance, if you see a proposed development coming up, such as, for instance, we've had people recommend to us that the Galway to Athlone Cycleway was coming on stream, and that gave the IWA an opportunity to provide commentary on that and to get in there at the planning stage. So, particularly, like use the guidelines, um, 
please do get in touch with me. I am happy to provide. We have lots of copies to provide of hard copies. The PDF is on the website. Send them to people who are doing developments. Make sure that you get there in there at the early stand, stages of planning. And that's how we can influence and influence public policy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma. Emma, we might if we have we might take two more. I'm just very conscious of time. Yes, certainly. There is one here for Fanula. Are all houses in Ireland not built according to the to the building regulations? <clears throat> that's a that's a tricky one, Emma. Um, first of all, yes. I mean, recent houses that would have been covered by the building. Any house that was built before the advent of the building regulations in 1990 um, would not necessarily have been built in accordance with building regulations. Since then, the um, application of part M of the building regulations, in other words, that you should have level access to get into the house, you should be able to circulate within the ground floor of the house and access a WC, but mind you, it's a very minimal WC. That only came into uh, effect in the year 2000. So in principle, any house that has been built since 2000 should at least have those features. But the reality is that to make a house really accessible, it needs a lot more than just those few things. Wonderful. That's um, thank you uh, for that. I think we leave the questions at that. I suppose um, on that point, just part of the work of the association is very much around uh, lobbying for change in public policy. And a lot of these issues are very live um, for us at the moment. And we're working closely um, with as the influencers in that area. And hopefully the access guidelines will be a big resource for us and to that end. So as we bring the uh, uh, official launch, we can consider them launched, I think, at this stage. I just want to extend a big thank you uh, to everybody who participated today in organising in the background um, and to our technical team, um, to Rosemary, to Fanula, Professor Gerard Quinn, Michael and Leona, um, to Oliver and John, uh, and uh, to Emma Jane and anyone else that I might be missing. Um, Emma there and Lisa in the background. Thank you all for your input today. I suppose what is our call to action? We can have many call to actions um, in the middle of all of this, but Rosemary probably summed it up there, is to con consider yourself as an influencer, uh, an influencer on accessibility in your own in your own household, in your own workplace, in your own community and in the bigger environment. Um, get your hands on a copy of our guidelines. They will be emailed out. Um, a useful resource and please do use them, pass them on, circulate them to people who are planning for design uh, of the built environment. Um, so thank you all for your participation today and wishing you all the best. Thank you.